All right. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back um, to the second presentation of this uh, session, which is called uh, Intelligent Applications. Um, if you're new to the session, welcome. Uh, my name is Manfred. I'm a sales specialist for uh, application services and middleware uh, across EMEA. And um, in this session, now I'm joined by Thomas and Clement, uh, who will talk about Apache Kafka and Quarkus. Thomas, in his main job, is a barbecue fanatic. And on the side, he also works for Reddit and governs uh, Quarkus development there. And then we also have Clement on, uh, in the presentation, who is, again, as a main job, he's a, a rabbit shepherd. So you may see some rabbits there in the background at some point. And on the side as well, he's uh, working a little bit on, on Kafka and Quarkus. Um, the presentation, the slides, and the recording uh, will be made available to you. You will receive an email in a couple of days um, with instructions how to get access to those. And with that, gentlemen, I'm handing over to you. Uh, please take it away. Thank you, Manfred. Uh, I, I wish my main job was barbecuing, actually, but <laughs> that's not really true. Uh, so uh, I, I'm just barbecuing on my, on my free time, basically. Uh, but but yeah, the demo we created for this today is going to have some influences both about, uh, about barbecuing and rabbits. So hopefully it will, will be fun. So uh, Kumal, do you want to say anything before we get started? Uh, yes. So, well, uh, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Clément. I'm... Also, I'm not uh, a rabbit shepherd on my uh, full-time job. I'm a distinguished engineer at Red Hat, working mostly on Quarkus and event-driven architectures. And yes, on the side, I also have rabbits, real rabbits. So you may see some jumping around me uh, during the presentation. Why? Wow, they must be high jumping <laughs> rabbits. <laughs> well, they go on the on the seat there, so okay. they say hi. <laughs> so. Let's get started then. So, so this topic is about modern data streaming with Quarkus and Apache Kafka. Uh, so uh, before we, uh, we do anything, we're going to cover a bit what Quarkus is. So if you haven't heard about Quarkus, we'll cover that. Uh, and uh, and yeah, so, so we'll get started with this. So if, if you're familiar with Java, Java's been around for 28 years, I think now. And, and uh, Java has been been designed has been used for many different architectures and, and we during those 28 years we've seen seen involvement in architectures so we see java going from mainly being used in monolith then starting to be used in microservices and now also in more and more in functions uh, and and one thing and the reason we created quarkus was because uh, maybe not every runtime fits every every pattern here there is different. Uh, there are different things that makes Quarkus really, really effective about uh, using it for the new architectures. So Quarkus is is really a Kubernetes native runtime that is designed specifically to work better in environments like microservices and functions. You can absolutely use it as a monolith as well, but there are uh, clear benefits when you use it compared to other runtimes uh, on microservices or or functions. Next slide, please. Come on. So. If you take a traditional Java runtime and you, and you try to put it in a container, it could look something like this. And this is the problem. And uh, we like rabbits. We don't like lions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, we but, but the problem here, of course, is that you can absolutely squeeze in a traditional Java application, an application server, or, or, uh, or even a bootable traditional Java application into a container and make it run. But it will behave a bit like this. It's, it's dangerous to touch it. It's dangerous to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to t take it down and reschedule it. And this is exactly the type of behavior we want in Kubernetes. We want the Kubernetes cluster to be able to reschedule pods as we go along, etc. And, and what we end up doing in this monolithic type of deployment is that we end up basically running it as a virtual machine. And, and, we, and that's what we want to avoid. That, that doesn't give us the benefit of, of using it in Kubernetes. And next slide, Clement. Yeah, so the, the hidden truth about this is that uh, Java, especially some traditional Java runtimes, has been designed to work on a container host uh, directly. And, and basically make sure it uses all the uh, available capacity to run up. And the problem is that, that it, taking that to a container environment or to a public cloud means that it, you're going to have increase of, of resource usage. Uh, so 
a framework that's been designed to, to not potentially care too much about make it using a lot of memory uh, and, and optimizing only for throughput compared to optimizing for throughput based on memory, which is what Corcus does. It will mean that it will cost more. It will cost more on CPU, it will cost more on memory, and, and, and that could mean that your quotas actually explode. And containers are really about sharing and deployment density. Uh, so that's what we want to get to. So next slide, please. So, yeah, so I mentioned a bit of this. Corcus is a, st as, as a stack to write job application. It's written for cloud native. It's written for microservices and, and serverless. So next slide. So but this talk is really about modern application and modern data streaming. And why, why do we talk about modern data streaming? Well, it's because in the, new, the net, in the new world, we also want to have intelligent apps. So when we're talking about intelligent apps. We're typically talking about software that are using some kind of artific artificial intelligence techniques to perform complex tasks that could be like predictions or automate operations or, or we just, just make, make sure that everything is working correctly, et cetera. And, and we, in the AI industry, we need to uh, we need to be able to unlock uh, because AI today has been very very focused uh, on very close connected to the data. So that's typically the data warehouse or the data lakes or where we keep the data. Uh, so so to be able to actually make use of uh, of AI and build app, uh, intelligent applications is what this talk is about, and this is what we're going to show you how we can do do this. So why are we focusing on this? Well. One of the things is that most of the AR is written in Python. And, and while Python is a really fantastic language to do some, some mathematic and, 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 and statistical and other things in AI, uh, there's a lot of AR frameworks available specifically for Python. Uh, it is potentially not the, the same type of applications that you want to use in your customer-facing uh, business applications. Uh, also, you, you probably have most customers, like most people have, uh, already built up experience to write these kind of customer facing applications using Java. So uh, so we really need to integrate these two worlds, like, like the data scientists using Python to write applications that are potentially not fault tolerant, potentially not performant, et cetera. And then we need to connect that with the applications that are customer facing. It has to be fault tolerant, it has to be performant, and have to do that. And, uh, and and also what we want to do is we want to continuously train those AI models. So we might want to push data constantly to and, and have a continuous continuous training of AI models so with near real-time data as well. So that's the use case we're talking about here. We're going to focus on the first one, which is the integration. But before we run into the what we this talk in this demo, I, I do have one more slide to talk about. Uh, so Red Hat OpenShift AI, which is really the enabler. We're, we're using part of, of that today and um, where we have deployed a, an AI service, which is gonna, it's gonna uh, analyze pictures for us and actually look for rabbits in there. The, 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 <laughs> the, what we're talking about here is that, that if there is a rabbit on a factory floor, uh, we know that's a problem. So we wanna avoid having Clemence rabbits escaping out to <laughs> into the wild into the factory floors so if that happens we're going to raise an alarm uh, so it's continuously watching and taking uh, taking pictures and then uh, if you find a rabbit in that picture it will immediately raise an alarm for us so so we are using this on openshift and we integrated this with with carcass services that we're going to see later on so take it away uh Clement, talk about yeah. data streaming. Yeah. So we want to talk about data streaming. And uh, well, data streaming is is a type of application that everybody understands. It's it's super simple to see how it how it behaves. You have data flowing from one place to another one and doing some processing in between, and everything is fine. Except that while a lot of people are talking about data streamings, when you start really thinking about it, you see that it's not that simple. There is some complexity around these kind of applications. There is an uh, architectural complexity because the patterns you are going to use are slightly different from the regular RPC or HTTP patterns. You would have public, uh, PubSub, you would have uh, DLQ. So it's a different set of patterns. 
the development models is going to be different and it's models plural because the model you are going to use in that component here is likely going to be different from the one you are going to see here and we will see the difference. It also has some operational complexity. How to keep things running? What about memory? What about lag? Is the data I'm processing really fresh or not? What about my utilization? What about my scaling? So all these need to be answered when we provide a good data streaming solution. So we could have talked only about Kafka. However, last year uh, with Emmanuel Bernard, I did a Kafka deep dive, which is available on YouTube. Uh, uh, it's three hours, so <laughs> be, aware, be aware of that. It's covered both development and ops, uh, traps and uh, patterns you need to use when you do Kafka. So I recommend it if you uh, are interested in developing Kafka application or running Kafka brokers. I could have talked about Kafka integration in Quarkus, but again, last year I've done the same kind of presentation and it's still relevant, it's still completely up to date. So here today, uh, we wanted to show you something slightly different. We want to talk about modern data streaming. What do I mean by this? So modern means cloud native, Kubernetes native. And part of that is that instead of having vertical scalability, having multiple consumer inside a single app, no, I want to have replicas on my app, which will be my unit of scalability. And I can go up and down like this. As Thomas said, it needs to be reliable. If the flow stops, it's not only your application that is in trouble. It's the rest of the pipeline that won't get data or that will start getting unfresh data and things like that. So it can be critical. So we need to have something reliable. We need to have re graceful remediation patterns, means that the application will auto-repair itself, self-repair itself. And obviously, we are in 2023. It needs to be secured uh, from the beginning to the end. That includes data integrity, authentications, encryptions, and so on. What about data streamings? Well, data streamings means that what we are going to manipulate are events. Those events might be sent into messages, which is what we do in Kafka, but the concept is events. And we are going to manipulate unbounded streams of events. We are not going to manipulate a collection or fixed size collection of events. It's really something that can be literally be infinite. And how you manipulate those infinite streams is slightly different uh, because you are you can't really do uh, accumulation across something infinite or you will have a memory issue. We also need to have actionable analytics. The data we want need to be fresh. We need to monitor the lag. We need to monitor all this and react according to that. And this leads to the later, later point, adaptive scaling. Based on the application and its behavior, based on the um, uh, processing time, on the lag, on the uh, arrival rate, we want to scale up and down your components. So let's go back to the basis. At the core of modern data streaming, you will have discrete events. Discrete events is an envelope with two main things inside. First, the metadata, and then the payload or the data itself. Among the metadata, the key is very, very important. The key is what will correlate events with other events. So that's very important. Don't miss that one. We also have the schema, but the schema is optional. And most of the usage we see are schema-less, while when you want to apply such kind of architecture at scale, we recommend to use a schema, which is the definition of the format of the data, which means that everybody can understand what they are exchanging. Once you have the definition of a discrete event, well, we have event streams, which are an unbounded sequence of related events ordered by time. The keyword here is related events, and this relation is mapped by the key. So the key inside the metadata is what we define two related events. So in these pictures, we have three uh, events, all having the same key, forming an event stream. The second part of that sentence is ordered by time, meaning that when we process one event of that uh, event stream, it means that all the previous events have been handled already. So we need to be sure that we don't lose the order uh, when we really want to keep it. If we think about this and start 
going back to what we discussed about data streamings and how how it was simply data flowing across the system, well, we can already start doing a first step by having this kind of abstract architectures with four layers. On the left side, you have, well, the data generator, data and event sources. So it can be sensors, can be uh, analytics coming from application, uh, um, browsers, HTTP request, whatever. That CINI is emitting events, which will be then received and uh, by the ingestion layer, which will maybe do some very simple processing and then writing that down and initiating the real pipeline, the real processing pipeline. This goes to the second layer, to the third layer, which is the stream processing. While at the ingestion layer, we want to handle a lot of events, at the stream processing layer, we want to do that um, in parallel using stateful or stateless uh, processing. We are really going to manipulate and reshape the streams. So very different uh, business logic. And then once the stream processing uh, completes, it goes to the last layer where we really see the data product, where we can do analytics, uh, we can do uh, data serving, so providing the data to other services and rich data and uh, data that add, add some values can be stored on a data lake or do such kind of things. Across this pipeline, of course, we should not forget that we need to handle the metadata. So what kind of data do I have? The schemas, if you are using a schema full approach, observability, uh, key for monitoring and uh, understanding what's going on, discoverability, how I discover a new type of event, how I discover uh, such kind of things, and obviously, as I mentioned already, security. So what, how do we implement such kind of application in Quarkus? Well, at the core, we are going to use a um, development model, which is named Reactive Messaging, uh, which is basically a set of annotations that let you implement event-driven microservices in Quarkus. So these annotations are incoming, ongoing. There is a few others, but basically it's five or six uh, annotations, relatively simple to understand. And basically your application is going to be connected to some broker or to some event source. We'll get the uh, events through a connector and then you will have CDI bin, which is a basic block in a Quarkus application, which will receive that data and process it and then send it to another channel and then another channel and then back to another connector that will write the data somewhere else, can be a Kafka, can be whatever. So, and those channels of communications are actually the name I have here. So order aggregate or report and things like this. Okay, um, before going further, we want to show you some demos to try to explain a little bit more what we are uh, intended to, to do here. So our demos is, is this one. So you, you can have the code here. I will give again the, the URL uh, at the end of this presentation. So we have temperature sensors, which provide, well, which produce temperatures, which will be ingested and then return into uh, uh, Kafka topics. On the other side, we have snapshots like um, cameras that will take pictures of our factory floors, same thing, take the pictures and then send it to Kafka. Those are measure are raw, low level, and just contain the device ID and the measure, but nothing else. The data enrichment layer is actually going to um, uh, look for that device ID and give a location, like, oh, that temperature sensor is in Stockholm, that temperature sensor is in Berlin, or something like this. Then once the data enrichment doesn't work by uh, communicating with a database, it sent two streams that will be handled by the alert manager. The alert manager will look at the temperature and if the temperature is not in range, send an alert, which we will see in the dashboard. Same thing for the camera. It will analyze all the pictures and uh, rely on a uh, um, uh, picture analyzer service that will look at the pictures, give us the set of objects that have been recognized. And based on this, uh, decide if there is a rabbit or not on the pictures. And we don't really don't want rabbits on a factory floor. So let's have a look at how it looks like. So it's deployed on, on OpenShift. Here are the main components. So we have Kafka, my broker. We have our device database, measure enrichment service. We have the alert manager, the picture analyzers, which is um, uh, uh, using TensorFlow in Python. I have multiple 
um, instances because it needs to scale. And then we have the dashboard. But right now we have nothing. We have, don't have any sensors. So if I go back here, oops, I refresh. I hope it's working. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, yeah. OK, it's coming. Uh, well, we don't have any message. We don't have anything. Everything is fine. So let's start some messages. So I'm going to go back to my IDE and just create some uh, thermometer. These thermometers will be pod. If I go back here, here we go. We have many pods. And all those thermometers are, I created here are just behaving correctly, sending correct temperature, no problem. Everything is fine. And we should see the number of messages per second increasing. And we will still, it, I think at the end, it's around 200 uh, a message per second, something like that. Not too much, but yeah. And uh, no problem. Everything is fine. So what's happening here already is that we have, we uh, receive the temperature and we are going to look up in a database to associate that device ID with the location and send another message enriched with that location. That's what we have here. This is my annotation I was mentioning. This is because I'm reading in a database, so I need to say that I want to run in a transaction. And I would just look for the device ID and send another message. Very simple. Now, I can go back and say, well, I want to create bad thermometer, something that sends data which is off. Again, it will be here. We recognize the icons, so that the Java icons say, ah, oh, they are not completely right. They are not Quarkus, so they cannot be completely right. So, um, and then we go there. Oh, we already have warnings. So two warnings, meaning that the temperature is off, is slightly not good. So how does that work? Well, the temperature alert manager is getting our enriched temperatures and analyze them. And if the temperature is not in a valid range, it starts sending a temperature alert. If it's in the range, just say, well, I skip the message. Everything is fine. It means that this temperature alert is then received by the dashboard and displayed. And yeah, something is off, but OK, fine. We can send someone to look at it. Second part of the demo is when we start having uh, snapshots. So I'm just going to create cameras. They are going to be created the same way. So right now, everything is fine. And the cameras are actually uh, very simple. They just, well, it's our fakes. Uh, and they just iterate over a set of images of five men in a factory. So everything is fine. Um, that one is fine. It looks like a factory. Everything is fine. Kind of a factory or factory under construction is fine. And a lab, but OK, fine. Everything is fine and so on. So if we go back here and I start looking at here, I see that I already have 32 image that has been processed. Uh, but everything is fine. Those pictures are all good, no problem. So if we look at how this works, I will go back to my uh, no, snapshot analyzer. It's slightly, uh, it's a bit different. So instead of taking my events one by one, this time I want to group them and do some batches and analyze uh, images batch by batch. And one of the logical uh, way of doing this is say, well, I want all the pictures from uh, Berlin, all the pictures from Stockholm, all the pictures from, uh, from Paris, which are the three locations we are managing today. So how to do this? Well, same annotations. But here, the signature of the uh, method is slightly different. Instead of having one event and returning one event, I'm getting a stream, a multi. It's a stream. So it's an embodied stream of data. And then we return another stream. And that stream is actually keyed by this key extractor. That means that we don't get a simple stream. We get a stream where, in that stream, all the messages have the same key, the location. So that means that this code will be run for Berlin, will be run for Stockholm, and will be run for Paris. And uh, if you have new location, it will be run for another location. So. That's great, but what do we do with this? Well, then we analyze those snapshots. And for this, I'm going to invoke uh, our prediction service, our object analyzer. The object analyzer is exposing a REST API, or HTTP API, which I invoked very easily using a um, Quarkus REST service, a REST client, sorry, uh, where this is my location. 
stock means that we are going to use service discovery to find it, but no problem here. And I'm just going to send the pictures and get the result back. However, well, it's slightly slow. So we need to be aware of that. So I need to protect myself. I need to be reliable. So in my case, I just want to do a retry. I will retry twice. Uh, I will add some uh, uh, and uh, a call can't exceed 20 seconds. If the call exceed 20 seconds, something is off. I can consider that the data is not fresh anymore and I need to uh, react to that failure. Uh, the rest of this code is just a response structure uh, that we get back. So everything is fine right now, but let's see when I start bad cameras. And those bad cameras are actually, in addition to this one, send this nice picture and this other very cute rabbit. Cute, but not on a factory floor. Definitely not. So when we recognize that there is a rabbit in the pictures, we clearly want to have an alert saying something is off. So let's see. We go back here. They have been created here and here. We see some icons. And we start, oh, we start seeing two warnings, one for, one for Stockholm. So let's try to see this. What picture do we have in Stockholm? Oh, we don't have it. Berlin, maybe? Yeah, that rabbit has been found in Berlin. And that's not normal because in Berlin, we were, we were expecting factory flaws. And this is not a factory flaw. So something is off. We need to act and we need to uh, uh, send someone there and either hunt the rabbit or at least catch it. Uh, maybe do some barbecue with it. <laughs> but uh, at least uh, something is wrong. Um, that's how I have to show on the demo. Uh, Thomas, do you have anything? No, I, I think I think it could be worth if you if you click on observe as well. Yes. And and, uh, and I need to go to the developer view. Yes. Here. Sorry. And if you scroll down to the memory. Uh, yeah, that's what a, I have here. Yeah. So so if you notice that the the top three memory consumptions here are the Python app uh, containers that are running the TensorFlow, etc., could be expected absolutely. But but really, what we want to think about here is 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 the capability of running the data ingestion, working effectively with streaming, etc. If you look at the at the Quarkus one, they're all running pretty pretty low here. I think the top next one is Kafka, and then we have uh, all the Quarkus one on, on less than 500 megabytes of memory. We could have gone further and compiled them to native, and we would have uh, compressed that memory even more. But uh, but as we can see, and in CPU use device, I think we're 100% fine on, on processing the incoming data in Quarkus. Uh, and, and this is really the, the, the power of combining the two technologies here uh, as well. Is that we yeah, can, be because yeah, right now we're speaking about 220 message per second, and some yeah. messages are pictures. So they are, they are limited to two megabytes because I reduce them, but it's a big thing. So it's not... It's not Simple uh, uh, hello world. Comparison, we're text. processing 86 images per minute, yes. per minute in that case, and not per second. So, uh, and, it it, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, but but that, that's why also the, the, the concepts of having back pressure or, or retries in this case is very, very important for us to, to, to make sure that, yeah, we don't get, get uh, the, that the user-facing user applications aren't affected by, by the fact that potentially the, the image analyzer might take a bit longer or queuing up, et cetera. Uh, Actually, what you said about back pressure is, is key. We have end-to-end -end back pressure on such kind of applications in the sense that our Kafka connector understand how much things are going on and decide to pause the consumption or pause the production if something can't be uh, processed later. So we have some uh, 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 analysis and back pressure support like this and uh, uh, fault tolerance, like the retry. And I will uh, discuss that a little bit later. Um, one thing I can do uh, before leaving this is killing all my devices. So we see it going back down. Why is that? Oh, we should mention as well that the tool you're using called Just, it's, it's just a command line tool, kind of like, like Make, if you're familiar with Make. So it's not something particular. It just executes the command that. Yeah, it's Come just uh, all my commands of my demos are inside just kind of file, and I just click on the green and uh, you know and just execute it. 
So, and we should see the number of messages going down. Yes, that's what yeah. we have. All right, so let's go back here. Again, if you want to see the code, uh, you can go there, you can deploy it, you can run it. Uh, everything is there and it's reproducible. So uh, very quickly, um, what we have seen, we have seen data ingestion, how it works, uh, the kind of things that we need to do. So here, the top concerns are protocol, concurrency, security, and resilience. So this lead to construction block, which will be asynchronous emitter, some kind of things that we see here, where I want to send data or translate from one protocol to another one. This type of code is very different from where we do cross the layer and we go to stream processing, where here the top concerns are expressiveness, elasticity and parallelization, not concurrency, parallelization. How do I process more uh, with more replicas? Obviously resilience. And here the construction block are really different. We want to transform events, reshape streams, materialize view, group by aggregate, joints, and things like that. Few example we have seen, um, or to look up in a database and uh, transform an event, or how do I manipulate the stream to group my events by a bucket of five seconds or do such kind of things. About concurrency and elasticity. Um, well, here in my demos, everything is relatively stable. We didn't have the time to, to really show you more, but we are working on, um, on automatically scaling your component up and down. And when I say down, it's down to zero, no message, nothing should be running. So how it works is that we are going to analyze um, the lag. So we are already doing this. We analyze the lag, we analyze the arrival rate, we analyze uh, the, resp the, uh, yes, the response time of the application. Um, and we apply the queuing theory and we have two, two, well, two strategy. One, which is, let's say more uh, FinOps, in the sense that we are going to look at the utilization of your resources and as soon as you can save safely, meaning kill one replicas and not overflowing the system, you will do it. And the other one is actually focusing on the freshness in the sense in the residence time. So the time between the emission and the production of the outcome messages. And in that case, it's because we want fresh data and you may have to pay a little bit more to be sure that you have fresh data. So that's the two uh, strategies we are developing. Uh, some one, well, they're still both a bit experimental. Um, time of resilience. So first, we need to understand that all our uh, application are storing, have access to a data stores, which um, uh, can be used for uh, materialized view, tables, or checkpointing. Um, we provide an SPI, it can use an in-memory data grid, like in Finispan, Redis, a database, uh, Kafka compacted uh, uh, topics, even if I don't recommend that. But yeah, we have that storage, which is shared among my replicas. Then if something goes wrong, we start with a local retry, with a at retry annotation, and it will preserve our during and retry with multiple times, can wait a little bit, because maybe it's a transient error, it's a network issue or something like that. After a few retries, if it's still not successful, it will go in a delayed retry topic meaning that the message that I've written here will be automatically registered inside my stream after some delay. So five minutes, 10 minutes, and so on. And if it fail again, it, we extend this delay and so on and so on. So this is one of our graceful remediation patterns. We re-ingest the data. Of course, this does not preserve the ordering, but at least you don't block and you don't stop processing. If at some point your application crash, then we under the, uh, the uh, rebalance protocol, which means that all the messages that has not been uh, processed successfully will be moved or will be assigned to another replicas of your applications. Because the state of your application is, is stored in our data store, the state of the processing is also restored when you do this. And obviously this works when we scale down, but it also works when you scale up. Uh, Thomas, I'll let you conclude. Well, actually, I want to do a time check. We we have some questions to answer. Maybe we should start with the questions here. Yeah, sure. Before we, we conclude, <laughs> so uh, uh, we the first question we had was, uh, uh, let's see, uh, what kind of database is used in the demo? So, as far as I know, the database we've been using is Postgres uh, in this case, uh, but it doesn't really matter for us. Quarkus supports using multiple, uh, a, a very multiple variants of, of SQL databases as well as NoSQL databases. 
we could have been using something like uh, InfiniSpan or DataGrid to store this or Redis or or Google, something MongoDB or Cassandra, etc. Uh, the nice thing with using uh, Postgres is, and, and we have this to New SQL databases as well, but that is that we have this layer called Panache. So Panache, which is a layer on top of Hibernate, makes it extremely easy to do this. So all we have is this Basically, this record. Are you looking at? Yeah, I'm looking at it, but I can't <laughs> find it. <laughs> I, I will find it. Uh, yeah, device entity. Yeah, device entity. So this is basically the device entity, uh, and and that that's the one that that's being stored in the database. Uh, we we should also mention that we are not really storing messages in databases here. Messages are part of Kafka cluster. And uh, what we're using the database for is, is to enrich the messages. So we're only calling it the database to enrich and find, for example, in which location a certain device is being hosted. Uh, another question was, hello, are you using Quarkus running with Graal VM or JIT? We're actually using JIT in this case. Uh, Quarkus is very efficient of using one, or JIT, meaning that we're running it on a GVM, on a Java container. Uh, so Quarkus is very effective at running in the other containers, but as I mentioned before, we could have actually compiled this to native and made it even uh, smaller in memory, etc. But uh, in this case, we didn't really start to stop any services. We didn't have a scaling example, so we did also didn't think there was a, really a need for using uh, Graal VM here. Uh, and then, then and this is a question for you, Clement. Uh, uh, do you know whether this technology can be used for some real-time processing? Uh, in the parenthesis, responses below a certain limit of time. So Kafka is not going to help you with such kind of strict requirements. Uh, Kafka will store the messages and you will uh, pull them, uh, but there is absolutely no guarantee that you are going to pull them within your limits. So that's not the right technology for this. There are other Java technologies like um, and I blank um, uh, from the London companies. Um, ah, well, if you come back, I will, I will mention it. Uh, just, uh, but that, there are other technologies that are designed for such kind of use case. But and, and we case should case. mention that in this particular use case, we're focusing more on event-based type of architectures. Yes. The devices are sending out events and reacting to events. Uh, so, and 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 that's that's not really an architecture based for for real time, uh, but it. It all depends on priorities. We could have prioritized certain messages over others, for example, to make sure that we have a, a response time within a limit. Uh, but um, yes, should we go back to the slides quickly? Yes, uh, sure. Uh, I see Manfred here now, so we're soon out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Manfred. Uh, yes, please, next slide. Uh, so yes, yeah, so just to report, to reiterate what we talked about in the demo here, we had different uh, data source uh, events, some of the temperatures. I would have liked to use barbecues here, but actually it didn't fit our, our <laughs> we didn't want to barbecue rabbits. So, <laughs> so we decided to go with, uh, with, with factory temperatures so here. So different devices are sending in temperature data and events, and, and it's our responsibility to, to um, ingest, uh, do ingestion on those finding out where actually this, this small event coming in, just reporting the device ID and the temperature now can be reached. We can reach it with information on where this, temp where this temperature device is actually located, et cetera. We can, we can then stream process uh, further, et cetera. So uh, anything else you want? I mean, we, we talked all about this, uh, being able to do machine learning analytics on, on, on the streaming data processing coming in. So we can have a lot of feedback looping as well. Like, like if there are, uh, if learn from where we didn't find an alert, but there still was an error. So it could be that the temperature is slowly going up and we actually want to learn that or, or, or show, showing a certain pattern of certain temperatures. We may can have an analyst, analyst about it saying that, analytics about it saying, oh, you're probably gonna be over, over a certain uh, range in, in temperature, for example. Yeah, we, we deliberately kept the, Code simple, but you can you can do lots of things like detecting devices that are offline, uh, devices where you kept the latest value and you verify that the variation is not too large or such kind of things. Yeah, want to bring up the next slide mm. and we want to leave that slide up. So no, oh, oh, actually this is the next one. Do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, well, um, one of the things is that Quarkus is based on a reactive core or technology or main event driven technology is named reactive messaging and. One of the key aspects of that is the scalability and the elasticity it can bring. 
So this is not numbers that from us. This is number from Decathlon, a sport retailer's uh, chain. And using right to messaging in GVM mode, so not in native, with Alpha CPU and 512 megabytes of memory deployed in OpenShift, they were able to handle 1 million of messages per minute per CPU per gigabyte of memory. Um, this is true high density. So that, that's the kind of things you, with, with our technology, you are going to have fun to develop. It's easy. So we have the live reload that we didn't show there. So easy to deploy to OpenShift or Kubernetes to do containers and so on, but also very good performances. And that's, that's actually really, really key here. Uh, yeah, I, I can do that one, Thomas, up to you. Yeah, I'm answering uh, so, the question in the chat here. So go okay. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so the road ahead, uh, it's, it's um, modern data streaming is an initiative we are uh, uh, in right now, and we want to continue that for uh, one year, two years. We, we don't know when we will be done. <laughs> Maybe we will never be done. Uh, but there is a few things we want to investigate. Uh, first, the expressiveness. We want uh, a better way to express joy and windowing, materialized views. Uh, we have support for that, but yeah, sometimes it feels complicated, clunky, and things like that. Protocols, we just merge uh, Pulsar. So if you don't want to use Kafka, but you want to use Pulsars, we now have a Pulsar connector that can let you, uh, well, you can use Pulsar. Um, MQTT, we do have an MQTT uh, connector, uh, but it does not support MQTT5. That's one of the things. We also have a RabbitMQ uh, connector, which has nothing to do with my own rabbits. Um, uh, but... It's been contributed by the community, and right now we didn't really have time to uh, well push it to the next level. That's something we are going to do too. Elasticity and resilience. I already explained our observability stories is is nice and but can be improved. Uh, integration with Keda is already there, but the auto scaling operators, which is named Scal, is where we want to go because that's that will bring our solution to really to the next level. And finally, integrating with others, uh, data science services uh, and storage, uh, data lake, data warehouse. Um, query support is something we are debating. Are we, I'm not totally sure we need to have it, uh, but maybe the data lake or the data warehouse are a better place for having such kind of things. I think that's all we have. If you're interested by the code, again, you have the URL at the bottom, or you can just uh, scan the left barcode. If you are interested by the slide, it's the right barcode. And I want to thank you very much. And do we have any other questions? I think we have covered all, all the questions from the chat. Um, thanks again very much, gentlemen. Um, it was an excellent presentation, excellent demo. Um, if you want, feel free to uh, take a photo of the, of the QR codes. But don't worry, you'll get all the slides and everything in a couple of days by email. Um, with that, we conclude the second presentation of this session. We'll now take a short break, two minutes, uh, but then make sure to come back to the next presentation, which will be again about uh, Kafka and some more AI ML topics. Uh, with that, thank you very much and see you in two minutes. <laughs>